We're beginning our second panel, which is going to be focused mostly on, uh, on the uh, new energy sources, new gas sources in the Balkans and what their plans are. Uh, the Southern Gas Corridor, Truck Stream, and LNG. And I would like to introduce our moderator, Ambassador Chakuta, who was ambassador to Azerbaijan between 2015 and 2018. He uh, is now with the Caspian Policy Center, and he just came back from Azerbaijan, so he will bring us also some news. Um, we have uh, three distinguished panelists today. Uh, ambassador Sher, uh, who is now uh, chairman of uh, BP um, in the United States, right? Right, head of international affairs. Right. We have uh, Benjamin Schmidt, uh, who was with the State Department Energy Bureau for several years, and uh, we have Rolf Mamadov, who is a fellow with Jamestown and the Middle East Institute, who is going to talk about different aspects of the topic today. Ambassador Chikota, please. Awesome. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, this is actually perfect timing because on Friday in Baku, they will have, I think it's now the fifth uh, Southern Gas Corridor Ministerial Advisory Council meeting. This uh, is a time when the ministers with all the, the countries that are involved in the Southern Gas Corridor get together, look at progress that's been made, chart, chart the next path, the next steps forward. Um, this year, it's particularly interesting because in many ways we're coming to the end of the Southern Gas Corridor. But one of the things which I heard about when I was there last week was looking at this part of the world, looking at the Caspian Basin as a uh, source of energy supply for the Balkans. And so a number of ministers for the Balkan countries are expected to attend Friday's meetings. Um, so again, perfect timing, and it also feeds well with what it is we've been talking about here. If I may say a couple things just to sort of get us started, and these are personal opinions, but um, sort of as we sort of heard earlier today, um, Nord Stream 2 escaped much of the media attention that was paid, or, uh, Turk Stream, and maybe that's a Freudian slip, um, Turk Stream escaped much of the media attention that was paid to Nord Stream 2 even though it exhibits many of the same reasons for international concerns. First of all, as we said, no new molecules to burst your, boost European and global energy security, while providing a new avenue for Russia to use energy as a means to exert pressure on Europe, threatening uh, countries' energy security, stability, and independence. Secondly, Turkstream can also undercut decades of US diplomacy designed to help develop and to bring to market the energy resources of the South Caucasus and Central Asia in a manner that prevents them from being interdicted by potentially hostile powers. Uh, so I think you know, our purpose here today is not just to analyze and discuss the problem, but maybe see if we can look at the various factors in play and see if we can come up with some effective ways to address them. So with that, I would like to turn uh, the floor over to my colleague, uh, Bob Scher from, um, from BP. Great. Well, thank you. Um, I, think I, I think I speak for uh, everyone from BP who hopes that the uh, Southern Gas Corridor isn't over uh, once it's completed. We're, we're looking forward to actually uh, uh, <laughs> providing uh, gas and getting paid for it. Um, but anyway, sorry, I guess that's a different uh, conversation. Um, look, thanks, uh, thanks, Bob. Uh, thanks to the Jamestown Foundation for facilitating tonight's uh, or today's uh, conversation. Um, obviously, this is an important region for not just BP, but in fact, uh, globally. And I'm glad that it uh, continues to get the attention of many uh, of the, the smaller and, and, and f intensively focused uh, organizations around the city because of that. Um, I think I'm going to make two uh, assertions uh, and hopefully back them up a little bit as well, but trying to stay within the, uh, the realm of the factual, not, uh, I, I work for an energy company, not, uh, we're not political, we try not to get in the midst of that, it's sometimes hard to avoid it, but I'm going to give it a shot. Um, 
But I do think it's fair to say that the Southern Gas Corridor is a strategic link between Europe and the Caspian region. I think everyone has seen it as this. This is one of the reasons that it has had bipartisan support in the United States, why it has had wide support in Europe, and why it's important to the countries um, through which this, uh, this pipeline goes. Um, second of all, I think um, an important piece is that energy security increases with diversity of supply. Again, one of the principles of why the Southern Gas Corridor is something that's been supported, but I think important as you look around the region, you look at the whole conversation we had earlier on, the gas to gas competition. Diversity of supply really is the important piece of all of this. Um, so I'd like to give a little context on what the Southern Gas Corridor is for those of you who may not be familiar with it, and I will try not to dwell too much given that many of you, I believe, are. Um, I think, as we all know, it was sort of first proposed in the European Commission's second strategic energy review, uh, 2008. There are multiple pieces to this, although we talk about this as one uh, contiguous pipeline. It is, but it is actually, from an uh, operational perspective, a number of different pieces. There's the, uh, the field in, uh, in Azerbaijan, off the coast, in the Caspian, of Shak Deniz II. There's the South Caucasus pipeline expansion that goes through Azerbaijan and Georgia. There's uh, TAP, the Trans-Anatolian pipeline in Turkey, and then uh, TAP, uh, sorry, TANAP, and then TAP, the Greece, Albania, and Italy piece of this. And I do think it's important because there are different actors, different players in each one of these, although there is consistency with BP and SOCAR being a part of, of all of them. Um, we obviously are very proud to be a part of this consortium that uh, we have a long history in Azerbaijan, not just in gas, but in oil. Uh, the contract of the century, which obviously many companies, uh, Western companies, signed. To some extent, we are, uh, we are one of the remaining ones uh, still invested and still continuing that work in Azerbaijan and looking to uh, increase our exploration there in the, the region. Um, at the peak, uh, this employed 30,000 people across Azerbaijan and Georgia. Um, the first piece was delivered on time and on budget. Um, we were able to start up Shak Deniz II, which is really the biggest portfolio project, uh, project in BP's portfolio for a long time, and a huge direct investment in the region. Um, as you guys know, I'm sure 16 billion cubic meters of gas per year is what we're looking at. Um, six transit countries, 11 shareholders, 11 gas buyers. Again, it's that strategic link. Um, it is not just important that we are providing gas to consumers and people who, you know, countries that need it, but also how many countries are involved, how much the political piece to all of this, the cooperation that had to be driven amongst all of these countries and customers, and how across the private sector as well as the public sector. Um, so, and again, uh, where we stand is that looking at that diversity of supply, that second piece I think is important. I'm going to take a, a little bit of a, of, a, of a tangent here because I think it's important, having heard a lot of the conversation in the beginning. I do think it's worth noting. Um, in 2017, I think um, people here can, can correct me, but somewhere between 35 and 40 percent of the EU's gas supply came from Russia. That is a, that, that, you know, if I get it right, that's the fact. Um, interestingly, over 40% at the same time of the oil that went to Europe was from Russia. But as I often say, when I go to, to Brussels, no one's going to complain to me about the dominance of Russia in the oil market in Europe. Now, why is that? because it's the market, because everyone knows that, that the market is, pardon the pun, far more liquid in oil. And that one country, one supplier, doesn't have as much of an impact on setting prices, on, some, on using that. The f infrastructure in gas is much more fixed, the lines are much more clear, and it is less liquid of a market. But that's really the key, and I think it came out in the morning, but I can't emphasize it enough, in that diversity of supply, integration of the infrastructure, increasing the amount of liquefaction plants to deal with LNG, all of that provides a ceiling on what manipulation could or might not be done by any supplier because there will be other sources available. So recognizing that that, for I think for us, in terms of being fans of diversity of supply and ability to get gas through the market, which the market itself 
is changing globally. That's an important piece of this. We're happy to be a part of that with the Southern Gas Corridor, but I also think, realistically, as I talk to our economists in London, uh, the idea that Russia is not going to supply a tremendous amount, a plurality, if you will, or at least a, I mean, not, you know, never a majority, but a plurality of natural gas to Europe, is it's hard to imagine that's going to be the case, um, that they would not provide that. But if there is a diversity of supply, then we should be in a place similar to the oil market where people are less concerned about that percentage. I, I always like to use an example of, I end up going to the same gas station pretty much every day. I mean, every time I go, about 90% of the time. But no one says that that it is a BP, by the way, just so people know, <laughs> but it's, it's right in the neighborhood. It's, it's not my fault. It's not my fault, uh, and I don't get a gas card, which I, I must admit I was a little disappointed by. Um, but uh, but you know, three blocks down the road is another gas station. If they start to take actions to be difficult, to ri raise their prices, I'm gonna go somewhere else. Just because I use that 90% of the time doesn't mean that I am dependent upon it. So I think we have to be very careful about understanding what, is, what penetration numbers, what market numbers, versus what is the dependency. So I, I think to me that is, uh, is something that goes back to that point of diversification of energy supply is something we should all be looking for, and that integration of the networks are key to being able to enable that. So I really think that, that what we're looking here is no one country can adversely affect the price. We're very happy to be part of that. And look, um, Europe, I think, is taking on this challenge and has done a, a pretty good job, I think, as the point was made. The regulatory environment, if actually looked at, if actually put into place, is something that is coming to fruition and, making, uh, and, and being a, a huge part of broadening energy security within Europe. We are really happy to be a part of it. Um, and frankly, that is, I mean, I can go into more details about, you, you see the map. I think we kind of have the map, though. It says Poseidon, but it's sort of along that line there. Um, I, I will close and just say that we are really excited to be a part of something that is a, of strategic importance, we believe, to both Europe and Caspian and knitting those two regions together. We far too, I, I think when I went to Azerbaijan for the first time, it was clear this is, uh, that they appreciate being seen as the furthest east of Europe and the furthest west of Asia. And to some extent, it's a great location to be in for them and how they envision themselves and l making that link so that Azerbaijan can look both towards Europe and obviously has always been an important link looking towards Asia as well. We're happy to help be a part of the linking back through to Western Europe. And I hope that, uh, that we as long with other people can be a part of providing that diversity and that energy security in Europe. I will stop there. Thanks, Bob. Um, turn the floor over now to, to Benjamin Schmidt to, to talk. Thank you, and uh, thanks to Glenn and Margarita and others for, for having me back to Washington today. It's great to see so many familiar faces uh, and talk about some, uh, some topics that are near and dear to my heart, uh, European energy security. Um, that's really so fundamental to the uh, national security of the United States partners and allies in the transatlantic community. Um, I'm currently uh, at Harvard University where I'm working at the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics uh, following my uh, four-year stint, uh, stint as the um, European Energy Security Advisor at the U.S. Department of State, working with, among others, uh, Ambassador Mary Warlick, who's in the audience today. Um, so it's great to see everyone here, um, where I focused on uh, the sort of uh, energy diversification and, and policies that are needed and continue to be needed for, um, for Europe to become more resilient to Russian malign um, energy activities and projects that are, are focused uh, on it uh, as a region. Um, but for just a second, I want to talk, uh, since Glenn uh, mentioned this earlier, I just, I just got back from, uh, from Antarctica, in particular the South Pole, um, where I'm working with a team uh, to develop a class of millimeter wavelength uh, telescopes for looking at the oldest light in the universe, the cosmic microwave background. So we're 
of course, not going to talk about the physics of that today, um, but I want to set that up because uh, you know I'm I'm here speaking in my private capacity. But I, I do want to say when I went down to Antarctica, I thought, okay, I've been focused so so heavily on on the day-to-day -day politics of European energy security for the past you know four plus years. This will be a real respite for at least a month to uh, be on ice and. Uh, and, and really have limited communication, so to kind of uh, take a respite from that topic. And, and I did, but uh, I got back, and just on Friday, um, I, I had forwarded to me a, a article in SNP Platts that reported that Russia's state geological uh, surveyor shot 4,400 kilometers of new subsea seismic in the riser Larsen Sea off the coast of Antarctica's Queen Maud Land, uh, in which they said that they're assessing the offshore oil and gas potential of the region. So of course that stands in juxtaposition to the environmental protocol uh, of the Antarctic Treaty System that was passed and ratified, among others, in the 1990s by the US, China, uh, Russia, and many European countries and other global partners. Um, it includes Article 7 that prohibits all activities related to Antarctic mineral resource uh, um, speculation except for scientific research. Um, so this is going to merit uh, in the following weeks and months, uh, you know, watching what, what happens in that space. Um, and, uh, you know, from this perspective, I just thought it was ironic that even if I was trying to take a respite from the geopolitics of energy in Eurasia while I was in Antarctica, Antarctica somehow is, uh, is still being touched by the geopolitics of energy. Um, so turning to the focus of today's conference, um, it's been made clear today that the actions of the Russian Federation and Gazprom in particular in the European gas sector have been focused on two main projects. Those are the 55 billion cubic meter uh, uh, Nord Stream 2 and the two 15.75 BCMA Turk Stream pipelines. Um, the first, of course, that we heard earlier was dedicated to the Turkish domestic market, the second allocated for onward transit to Europe via Bulgaria and onward. Um, and they would provide the Kremlin with the technical capability to make good on its long-standing and publicly acknowledged policy objective of ending or significantly reducing gas transit via Ukraine. Um, and, and so I was asked today to talk about some of the impacts that this uh, project would have on Ukraine in particular at this really critical juncture as we got through the, um, the new gas contract uh, at the start of this year. So despite claims by Gazprom that these projects are aimed at bringing significant new gas volumes to Western Europe to quote, fill in for an emerging uh, uh, gas consumption gap uh, because of declines in Groningen, uh, they're, you know, the, the, the design of these projects actually betrays that narrative. Uh, the onshore extension of Nord Stream 2, which is named Oigal, is principally directed eastward toward the Czech Republic and route to OMV's gas distribution hub at Baumgarten, Austria. Uh, which is the de facto end of the current Ukrainian gas transit route from Russia to Europe. Uh, so only under 20% of the project's capacity is actually allocated um, for, for direct delivery westward. Well, the remaining majority is aimed at replacing volumes currently transiting Ukraine. Um, likewise, and this is happening right now in real time, the two trunk lines of the Turk Stream pipeline are aimed at a few things, maintaining Russia's gas position in Turkey, which it's somewhat unclear. It looks like they're still uh, reducing their uh, overall gas consumption dependency on Russia with LNG, for example. Um, and also in the Balkan region would crowd out global gas competitors um, and uh, in great competition for, for example, the Southern Gas Corridor and, and global LNG shippers uh, in the region. Um, at the same time, reducing the volumes that these regions currently receive via the Ukrainian GTS, gas tr transmission system, and onward through the Trans-Balkan line. Um, so we can kind of do this as a test example. What happened? So, so the two lines are currently online as of uh, January 1st of this year. And following the beginning of operations of TurkStream, the uh, on the 1st, the project has already had impacts on both Ukraine and the Balkan EU member states. Uh, if you look at a ICIS report that came out in January and it's continued to today, starting on January 1st, Bulgaria's TSO, Bulgar Transgas, reported that the initiation of gas operations uh, for Turk Stream um, uh, basically uh, had imports from Turkey being at 10 MCM per day with the flows via Ukraine to Bulgaria, Greece, and, uh, and Turkey completely diverted uh, to Turk Stream from the Ukrainian GTS route. Likewise, the amount of gas that's entering uh, Romania from Ukraine has significantly decreased to about 15% of where it was in December. Um, it's a concerning trend, uh, but with comparison to Nord Stream 2, 
uh, the development of which is currently stopped owing to U.S. sanctions actions that, that were deployed in December. Uh, the direct impact on Ukraine is for now blunted, since the Nord Stream 2 pipeline would allow Moscow to divert almost four times the volume of the second line of Turk Stream from the Ukrainian route. So, well, whereas it's it's somewhat in vogue to say, you know, everyone's talking about Nord Stream 2, but the real threat is Turk Stream, there's no question that Turk Stream's a threat. Uh, the fact of the matter is that if you combine these two pipelines, it will not only be impactful as it already is on Ukraine, it'll be a disaster. Um, that's that's really what we're uh, we're looking at um, in the in the current state of play, um, and perhaps more worrying is the impact uh, on Ukraine's national security itself. In addition to loss of transit revenues and impact on its economy and GDP, in the short term, um, the current gas transit co agreement between Naftagas and Gazprom that was extended at the start of this year uh, and it averted a uh, potential gas crisis I think most of the people in this room saw coming unless there was some sort of uh, action to, to, to help that not be the case. Um, the, uh, the, the dependency that Russia has on the pipeline infrastructure, the actual physical infrastructure to get its gas to market via Ukraine continues to have that dependence on gas pipelines that are physically adjacent to the line of contact in Donbass. Um, and especially in the context of last week's military escalation by Russian forces against Ukrainian positions along the line of contact, the potential security knock-on effects of Nord Stream 2 is worrisome to say the least. So if there's no dependency that the, that the Russian Federation has on that physical infrastructure that's, that's actually near where the current fighting is in eastern Ukraine, um, it really raises questions on, you know, is there one less strategic, um, you know, uh, break on further aggression in that region? Um, and we should also look at the impact on the transatlantic community, because this is not, quote, just a commercial deal. This is a project and a set of projects, if you include Turkstream, uh, for Russian strategic corruption and malign influence to be, to be pushed into, uh, into the West. Um, for example, um, at the time of Nord Stream 2's announcement in 2015, several of the European then shareholders, including OMV and BASF Winterschall, signed lucrative asset swap agreements with Gazprom for gas production rights upstream in the Russian Federation. And they had been previously been put on hold for a very short period of time following Russia's illegal annexation of Crimea and aggression in eastern Ukraine. Um, at the same time, if you want to say, like, what, what's Moscow in it for? Uh, a hard-hitting 2018 spare bank analysis revealed that Gazprom's investments in projects like Nord Stream 2 and Turk Stream are in fact significantly, quote, value destructive for its shareholders and analyze, and get, get, these numbers are incredible, analyze that it would take Nord Stream 2 at least 20 years uh, to break even and become profitable, and Turk Stream 47 years, think about that, 47 years from today minus you know, six weeks uh, for, for the first profits to actually come back to, uh, uh, back to Gazprom for that and its, its shareholders. So instead of normal commercialities, these projects are used as a means of enriching contractors, as, as Misha said, um, with close ties to Russian President Vladimir Putin, um, some of which are already targeted under the US sanctions program, such as Gennady Timchenko and Arkady Rotenberg. Um, but it really doesn't stop there. So Moscow's use of geopolitical projects like Nord Stream 2 and Turk Stream um, are also a means of channeling benefits to favored Russian oligarchs, and it's not limited to domestic allies. It includes, of course, the notoriously German Chancellor Gerhard Schroeder, who advocated for the first Nord Stream pipeline while in office and then was appointed chairman of Nord Stream AG shortly after leaving. Of course, some folks say that he's uh, the most effective Trojan horse uh, for Putin in Europe, but it's to me a little bit, uh, you know, doesn't quite make sense because that would be saying that the Greek army is kind of just rolled in without a horse built around it. It's pretty obvious what's going on. So yeah, exactly. It's not, not that, uh, you know, that, not that big of a surprise. And then over the past few years, this Schroederization, um, as the term has is, is kind of uh, grown in the past few years, has, has continued. Um, for example, former Austrian Chancellor Christian Kern uh, penned a strong letter, uh, then co-authored by, um, at the time, the German Foreign Minister Sigmar Gabriel, that decried the 2017 Countering America's Adversaries Through Sanctions Act, or CATSA. Um, he did that, was appointed to the board of Kremlin-controlled Russian railways last year, while former econ minister Hans-Jörg Schelling left office after advocating for Nord Stream 2 um, and is now an advisor at uh, Nord Stream AG. So for just a second, imagine if uh, President George W. Bush or President Barack Obama were currently working on behalf of China's Huawei. Just imagine that 
take a moment, imagine that. It wouldn't just be a story in Washington, it'd be the only story, okay? It'd be the only thing we're talking about. Unfortunately, that is not the case in Europe, um, and, and for some reason, the electorate in, in some European nations seems to have accepted this Schroederized status quo, and therefore there's little political motivation for former senior officials to resist becoming well-compensated conduits of Russian malign influence through these infrastructure proposals. Um, so if there's any hope, if I just leave with, with one thing before we move back to the Balkans and, and I close up, if there's any hope of reversing this, uh, this trend of Russian malign energy influence, um, a more frank pu public discourse on these trends really seems to be merited both in Washington and across, uh, across the Atlantic with our European allies and partners. So what can we do? So that's kind of the state of play. What can we do? What can be done to counter these uh, physical embodiments of that, that hybrid campaign from, uh, from Moscow? I, I wrote an article about this. I continue to hold that I think a, a US-EU cooperative double play is merited and, and should continue to be, uh, uh, to be pushed for in this, uh, to, to face this issue set. So over the fast, past three months on the US side, the US has already let off with two major actions. The first was a limited technology calibrated sanctions action that was contained in the 2020 National Defense Authorization Act, which targeted vessels and technologies facilitating the Nord Stream 2 pipeline and, and actually Turkstream as well. Unfortunately, Turkstream was already completed by the time this was passed, so it didn't have a direct impact on the offshore of that. Um, and that actually stopped the physical deployment of Nord Stream 2. The sanctions were long in the making, but they were enacted rapidly uh, in December uh, so that, it, that Nord Stream AG could not finish the last 20% of its deployment. Uh, on December 11th, the House passed the NDAA, 17th of December, the Senate, uh, and then both after you know, being both passed by an overwhelming bipartisan majority, uh, the White House uh, had a signing ceremony at Joint Base Andrews on December 21st, and it was it was pretty interesting to see in a fairly dramatic, you know, a lot of these, you know, energy projects that we've been talking about for years and years and years have really kind of a slow burn about things going on. But in, in a real-time scene, just minutes before the signing took place dramatically, um, the principal Nord Stream 2 pipeline vessel owned and operated by, uh, by Swiss firm Alsees suspended its pipe deployment and rapidly exited the Baltic Sea in the following days. And, and it was followed by many online on, um, you know, maritime, I think it's marine traffic, maritime traffic, the uh, um, chip trapping web website. So it's something in foreign policy you don't see that often, at least in the geopolitics of energy, something happening that, that rapidly. So in the, in the interim period, the last two months, um, part of what I was in Antarctica and since I've been back, Gazprom's made no progress in advancing the project. Um, but it would be untrue to say that the threat's gone and it's entirely impossible for Moscow to complete Nord Stream 2, um, although the difficulty is significantly heightened and there will be significant delays. Um, it's clear uh, from statements from the head of Russia's United Shipbuilding Corporation that, um, that were made back in December, it could take up to you know, between four and six years for Russian industry to develop, build, and deploy a specialized pipe layer, pipe layer of the scale and sophistication with, with uh, um, real-time uh, directional positioning uh, as all sees pioneering spirit that had left the project. Um, so there was this ship, Academic Chirsky, who's uh, apparently on its way to the Baltic Sea. We'll see what happens uh, with that. It does not have the right, um, uh, uh, it, the, the right uh, dynamic positioning systems and ROVs, et cetera, the technology that was permitted under the Danish permitting process that, that ended in uh, October. So I think that will continue to uh, take quite a while for Denmark to either review the permit, update the permit, do that sort of thing. So there's, there's some time. And, and it won't just go ahead as is without having these technologies, because um, as, uh, as Margarita wrote in her article recently, um, there are large-scale chemical and conventional munition, munitions dumping sites from World War II and, uh, and the Soviet era in that region uh, that you just can't put anchors down on the seabed. So it's, it's something that, that uh, we need to keep watching, at the, uh, watching uh, during that period. At the same time, the United States should continue to ensure that there are already enacted sanctions that were passed under the NDA are fully enforced and continuously monitored to maximize the potential that the project is not physically completed in the near term, which gets us to the second part of the double play, what Europe can do um, to, uh, to basically stop this project from having a, a you know, significantly negative impact on, uh, on Europe. 
That's because updates to the EU gas directive that were completed in spring 2019, under which Nord Stream 2 uh, will still face significant regulatory challenges, um, even if it's ultimately completed, since the project would then be subject to the full force of the gas market liberalization statutes of the package, including ownership unbundling and third-party access, which Gazprom is, is of course, reticent uh, to do. And this is especially due to Article 11 of the gas directive, which I wrote about last fall, um, which will require the national regulatory uh, authority of the host member state, in this case, Germany's Bundesnetzagentur, to decide or with, potentially withhold certification for a project if it harms the security of supply of other member states of the EU or the EU as a whole. And I think that everyone here today can see that Nord Stream do demonstrably at least has some impact, if not significantly does that. Um, the European extension of Turk Stream is right in the same vein, uh, would of course have to undergo similar permitting by Bulgar Transgas, and thus its onshore business model is challenged due to the good work of the EU market liberalization process that's been underway since the European Energy Union was established in, in 2015. There are challenges to this going on right now, and something that I, I just want to make a quick note of before wrapping up um, is that there are, the supporters of Nord Stream 2 are, are still trying to get out of having um, the third energy package be uh, fully deployed. Uh, one of the things that came out in German press in, in November 2019, the Bundestag passed legislation that adopted the gas directive in such a manner it could be potentially used to facilitate arguments that Nord Stream AG's uh, bid to circumvent the third energy package could be successful by uh, challenging the commonplace definition of, of uh, com uh, quote, completed uh, energy infrastructure. Uh, Handelsblatt at the time described a legal loophole inserted in the legislation that the Bundesnetzagentur, and of course this, is, this goes for Bulgar Transgas as well if, if it goes that way uh, in Bulgaria, um, it could possibly take into account, quote, that the project company already made billions in investment by May 23rd, 2019, and had relocated a considerable part of the management. This would facilitate a line of argumentation that, although the pipeline was not physically completed, did not hold all the necessary construction permits, was not operationally capable of conveying natural gas at the longest extent, somehow it would be, quote, completed by virtue of finance, uh, uh, financial <laughs> investments made. Furthermore, German media also, over the past few months also described what Nord Stream AG is trying to do um, to, to get out of the full impact of the law. That scheme would involve creating a shell company under which Gazprom could sell the last 12 nautical miles of the pipeline as it enters the German territorial sea to avoid having to comply with ownership unbundling requirements. In this scenario, Gazprom would be the sole owner operator for the remaining uh, more than 90% of the pipeline through the Baltic Sea, allowing Gazprom to argue essentially that the gas offtake point could simply be identified as on the Baltic seabed at the boundary of the German exclusive economic zone. This is despite the fact that physically the pipelines are pipelines, there's still one continuously operating infrastructure installation. So both of these interpretations require legal fictions, which I say are legal fictions that, that are taken a bit too far, that really need to be uh, you know, uh, looked after in Brussels and, and in other member states to make sure that, that everything, if Nord Stream 2 is ever um, somehow completed physically, that, that this, is, uh, this is fully under EU law. So to wrap up, I want to say there are, there are reasons to be optimistic here, especially in the Balkan region where there's been a lot of, uh, of really great developments that have been exciting for me having uh, looked at the space and visited uh, in particular Greece quite a bit during my time at state. Um, Bulgaria has uh, long been nearly fully dependent on Russian gas, now has the opportunity to choose to reduce this dependency given a few of these projects that are starting to come online. Over the past few years, Greece has upgraded the LNG import capacity of the terminal at the port of Revathusa near Athens, and it's also increased the cross-border physical interconnection capacity on the Greek-Bulgarian border at the Kulata Sidero Castro crossing. This allowed for the ability of Bulgaria for the first time in history to import LNG directly from the global gas market, including a, uh, a cargo from US sources, for the first time. Second, in May of last year, the long-planned interconnector Greece-Bulgaria, IGB, uh, began its construction phase and hopefully will be done by the end of this year and then can get gas from the southern gas corridor uh, 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 from the Shaktanese fields running from Komotini, Greece, to Stara, uh, Stara Zagora, Bulgaria. At the same time that this has happened, um, the EU continues to support projects of common interest through its Connecting Europe facility along NATO's eastern flank 
uh, including the Norway, Denmark, Poland, Baltic pipe and the gas interconnector Poland, Lithuania, which are both vital projects to enable Warsaw to basically realize its vision of, of diversification away from Russian energy dependence in the next few years. And to bolster this effort, bipartisan support from US Congress allowed the US International Development Finance Corporation to dedicate just two weeks ago up to a billion dollars to support infrastructure proposals, including energy, in the three seas region. So in closing, by not only opposing Russian malign energy activities and projects that would undermine Europe's energy security uh, through things like sanctions and, and opposition to Nord Stream 2 and Turk Stream, it's also offering substantial financial assistance to help nations in Europe complete long-planned energy diversification projects. And it's provided strong evidence here in Washington that the United States is really committed to supporting the national security interests of European partners and allies rather than motivated by this sort of mercantilist desire to simply, quote, sell more US LNG uh, abroad that um, gas prominence allies have alleged falsely for, for some time. So I really just want to end there. And thanks again for having me down to Washington and look forward to the discussion. Thanks. Thanks. And actually, one point I think we'll want to come back to is the point that you made about under the new law that sets up the Development Finance Corporation, um, the ability to finance energy projects in the three Cs area. Um, one of the things which, um, during my time um, in the Energy Bureau, was at the State Department, and, and later there was sort of a problem where some of the restrictions on what it is the U.S. could do to actually help finance these projects. Yeah. Um, let me turn over the floor now to Ralph Mamadov, who is a, a senior fellow with the Middle East Institute and also um, formerly has held a number of senior positions in SOCAR, the Azerbaijani State Oil Company. And uh, including their office here in Washington. So, thank you. Um, One quick note about uh, Ben's uh, comments about the academic Chersky. Uh, it does have DP, but uh, dynamic positioning, but doesn't have, I'm sure, I agree that it doesn't have uh, all other equipment required for doing the job in Baltic Sea. Uh, it's on its way. It's, it's actually going to be in um, Colombo, Sri Lanka, probably tomorrow. So, let's see where it goes. Um, when it comes to um, the Balkans and the LNG uh, dynamics there, uh, I'll, I'll just um, start talking about the challenges that the Balkans had when um, the, uh, the Russia-Ukraine gas uh, dispute happened and what has changed and what to expect in the future. Um, so the reason because I'm talking about the, uh, the gas dispute is I think that that was the game changer for the whole Europe where Europe decided to, um, and in cooperation with the United States, to take this uh, energy security issue uh, more seriously than it was before. Um, so what we had uh, in our hands uh, when the crisis happened, uh, we had um, a, a lack of interconnecting infrastructure in Balkans. Uh, we, ca we had a lack of uh, harmonized legislative framework. Um, the consumption levels of gas is uh, incredibly low compared to other parts of the Europe because of uh, indigenous coal mainly. And of course, uh, given that the, uh, the consumption and energy production was coming mainly from coal, um, it, was, um, it was difficult for gas to compete with it. And then there was some other specific problems such as uh, Gazprom's uh, pipeline gas. Of course, it wasn't cheaper pipeline gas, as it was mentioned today. Uh, actually, Balkans paid uh, more than anyone in the, in the region. Uh, and I think the average price was 30% more than uh, other, other parts of the, uh, Europe. However, um, uh, it's a pipeline gas. And uh, as uh, Mr. Sher mentioned, uh, the, the importance of the infrastructure is, is, is key here. And they had the infrastructure, which was supplying uh, gas to this part of the world. Uh, and then there was uh, Gazprom's um, you probably don't see it. These are all the Gazprom subsidiaries in the Balkan countries. You can see the list um, uh, there. It's uh, in every single country, and in most of these countries, they actually own the main uh, TCOs. I mean, have their shares in the main TCOs. Uh, so that was the main obstacle for the Balkans to, to become a major gas hub and then uh, to become an LNG hub. Um, so what changed? Uh, what changed was the, the, the global industry changed. Um, the technology, the advent of LNG technology has led to um, uh, uh, the eradication of the uh, constraints which were specific to the uh, gas industry. Um, gas has be, uh, started being transported through um, 
uh, with the uh, with the with the tankers, which was a game changer for the industry. And other changes was, of course, uh, again the uh, the improvement of technology, uh, which led to the U.S. shale gas, and the U.S. has become one of the largest uh, producers of the gas in the world, and that uh, meant also uh, more supply to the world market. Um, uh, and uh, uh, specifically in LNG technology, uh, the next stage was um, uh, the floating uh, uh, regasification unit, FSRUs and FS FPSOs, which are, uh, gave uh, more uh, logistical solutions for the LNG suppliers uh, and, and the gas suppliers to reach its customers. Um, the regionally what happened in, in Balkans, there was uh, more pipeline infrastructure encouraged by the EU. Uh, it was mentioned here, the projects of common interest uh, uh, encouraged more uh, projects. And there was also pipeline projects uh, coming into the region from outside. Uh, Southern Gas Corridor was mentioned here and then Turk Stream Pipeline from Russia. So more infrastructure, more interconnectors. And there was regional developments. There were gas discovered in, in, in adjacent territories, in neighborhood, um, namely in East Med, which was uh, traditionally the importer of gas. Um, so we have the, the, the pipelines mentioned here, um, the, both interconnectors and the main trunk pipelines that come uh, from the from east. Um, and what implication it has for the market? Again, market globally has become more abundant, uh, which has been the case for the last two or three years. Uh, more gas meant uh, also uh, the shift from the uh, long-term oil linked uh, contracts to more spot-based uh, uh, methods or formats. Um, also, the EU, EU's third energy package and EU's uh, efforts to, uh, to increase the infrastructure at the same time to, uh, to create more agility in the region uh, led to the uh, more pipeline interconnectors as well as uh, reverse flows uh, clauses which led the uh, uh, countries to export and import the, pipe, uh, the gas. Um, Another regional development uh, was the uh, more LNG infrastructure, not in Balkans, namely, because uh, there, we, we still don't have any uh, LNG terminal in, 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 in Balkans. It's more like in southeastern Europe parts, uh, mainly in Greece and Turkey. But again, these uh, uh, LNG terminals, namely the FSRUs, have become more instrumental to bring in more gas uh, to the region and making the, uh, the region at itself uh, as diversified and abundant with the gas. Um, so these are the two keys, two FSRUs that they have uh, right at the moment. Uh, as a result of this, Turkey actually became the second largest importer of, of LNG in Europe and, and seventh in the world. Um, and as was mentioned here, last year in the first nine months, actually Turkey imported as much as gas via LNG as uh, from Russia, which was a great achievement for Turkey. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the one of the FSRUs are in, uh, in Hatay, where, which is where Turkey is bordering Syria. Another one is Aliaga, uh, where my, my previous company has a uh, refinery. And there, there is a F FPSO and uh, a FSRU standing there, which actually led to Turkey becoming an uh, important uh, LNG import, uh, importer in the, in the region and the world. Uh, and then, then Greece has, it was mentioned, the Rebithausa LNG terminal. Um, uh, and uh, there is another one, uh, FSRU, actually to be built at Alexandropoulos, um, which uh, Bulgaria has shown interest uh, to acquire 20% uh, of. Um, and uh, but there are still problems. There are still challenges, and the, and the challenge is is that most of these pipeline projects that has been started or has uh, has done a, has been done a feasibility study, they haven't progressed as fast as we've seen in Nord Stream or Turk Stream's case, which was uh, meteoric speed. Um, so what are the situation? What what are the status of affairs in, in respect to these pipelines? Brua gas pipeline is under construction. Uh, I'm, I think I'm optimistic here if, if I say that half of the pipeline has been built. I think two thirds hasn't been built yet. The real number, the actual number is. Uh, Bulgaria Greece interconnector. Uh, this probably is the uh, 42 kilometers it has been built and 100 left, still under construction. East Ring pipeline, I think no tangible progress has been made there. It's just a pipeline dream at this moment. And then um, IAP gas pipeline, uh, that's, uh, they are just completed the, uh, the design of the pipeline stage, but uh, the actual construction hasn't started. Uh, in terms of the LNG terminals, we have uh, Croatia has been building uh, this Kirk Island terminal forever. Uh, th there were some uh, financial issues, uh, commercial issues, then um, 
you know, the state company took, uh, took the project on its shoulders. Now um, it's, it's still under construction, it hasn't been built yet. Uh, I mentioned the Alexandropoulos FSRU uh, uh, degrees. They have, they're doing the market test, they're receiving bid, biddings at the moment. And uh, one new one, actually a very exciting one, is Montenegro's uh, just proposed by, uh, LNG terminal. This is also going to be FSRU, I think. That's in a, in a deep water bar port uh, of Montenegro. Um, so this is the overall situation, what we ha we're having now in the, in the Balkans. Uh, what, uh, what my, my real concern with the Balkans is I'm optimistic that there are, there are more uh, imports coming, more LNG coming to the region, which means you know, diversification, which means cheaper gas. But the problem is that none of these projects, especially the LNG projects, were completed during the, uh, when the prices were um, super high compared to what we're seeing right now. When the JKM prices, Far East Asian market prices were around 16 uh, MBTU, where, which is uh, around five or six right now. Um, so I think um, if, if these projects were completed uh, by this time, uh, Balkans would have more competitive edge over other uh, uh, terminals. Uh, now that prices uh, have gone below $3, and um, we don't, and there, there is a forecast that the, uh, uh, the, the abundance in the market, um, the LNG, uh, the prices might uh, remain like this with the, with the virus going on in China and China and uh, Japan being the largest importer of the LNG, almost 80% uh, of the um, uh, LNG is imported there, then we might have issues. Um, the uh, Balkans, could have uh, uh, catch the, the LNG train, uh, but um, I think they have missed it for now. Thank you. I'm trying to maybe pull some of this together and get a discussion going here among people on the panel. And I think, um, Ralph, you sort of brought a key point up um, towards the end here, because as, as Bob said at the beginning, diversity is essential for, for energy security. A diversity of supply, diversity of sources, diversity of types. Um, but one of the other realities um, is that there are market forces involved. In the past, when the United States and the UK and others, for example, worked on things like the contract of the century or the Southern Gas Corridor, prices were in a certain place. When we go back to the contract of the century, even the Southern Gas Corridor, there was thinking about peak oil, um, which is now a charmingly archaic notion. Um, sort of back there with you know, horses and buggies or something. Um, but the markets changed, the technology changed. And so what I'd like to try to throw out to the panel is how do you see, I mean, we've talked a lot, you know, in the first panel and discussion so far about the geopolitics. And the geopolitics have a key role here because certainly the, um, it's a factor. Uh, as, as noted, you don't, I don't think any, I'm looking at some reps here from, from companies, I don't think any of you would be, you know, get too far with your board if you were suggesting we have a project that's going to take 47 years to get a return on. Um, but how do you see the market outlook, which again is, you know, certain ch uh, changes in terms of demand in Europe, but also changes in demand globally, Europe may be staying steady, but Asia rising dramatically. Uh, right now, discussion about large supplies of gas from the U because of the US, Australia, others, come, Mozambique coming online. Uh, but it takes a while to build a pipeline. It takes a while to be looking at some of these things. In some ways, you need a longer term view. How do you guys see the market sort of entering into this equation? I'm, I'm not, not an economist, uh, <laughs> but I think um, obviously all of those factors play in. Um, I mean, I, I have to say I was struck by the idea that uh, while representing an energy company, I think we, we generally would rather not have a, a low price for our commodity. On the other hand, as a consumer, I think it's good to have a low price, right? Just, just checking. Um, uh, you know, I mean, uh, you know, it, how how horrible is it that countries in Europe want to have the cheapest gas available to them? Um, I think that's something that we have to consider. As we, I, I say it flippantly. On the other hand, I think it's something that has to be considered because um, it's very hard to look at a country and say don't get cheap gas because it's not in your interests. 
Um, whereas I think many of them are going to say it absolutely is in our interest to get the cheapest gas possible. It's good for my industry. You guys are having cheap gas. I have to compete with your industry. Why should I have to pay a premium for my gas? Because you tell me. It's an interesting discussion to have. It's one I'm glad I don't have to. Um, I think there's an argument for that discussion, but that's also something that uh, from market forces is difficult. I do think what's interesting is to look at um, I think natural gas is going to be, we, we believe natural gas is going to be more uh, important to the global economy. Um, it is a crucial piece of getting towards a lower carbon emissions future. It is not the end piece of it, but it is absolutely a key piece, especially if you can imagine the, the drop in carbon emissions you would have from switching from coal to gas on a routine basis throughout Asia. Um, that would have a huge impact and is probably something that we would all want to see. So I think we still see there's a great future for that. What of course is interesting is, as you can imagine, natural gas becoming a more commoditized, more on the spot market sort of a, of a commodity, um, how do you look to put huge investments into infrastructure? Uh, it's, a very, it's a tough piece to square. Um, if you're looking to be driven by market forces and not other forces. So I think that's going to continue to be a concern and, a, and, a, and an issue, but um, I don't see any, I see the near term to medium term future of natural gas is very good and is very positive because of its lower carbon emissions, assuming that we can make sure to maintain and track um, methane um, emissions as part of that process. And I, I just, that's that's a fantastic overview. And I, I think just to add, um, you mentioned uh, market forces versus other forces. Um, that's absolutely true. It's, it's, you know, certain calculations will go into these large scale infrastructure projects from, you know, a commercial company like BP or others in the, the, the global market. When we look at command economy, authoritarian state owned enterprise uh, companies like, uh, you know, like those in the Russian Federation, they don't operate on the same um, market you know, <coughs> driven forces mentality that um, that a lot of these other companies do. That's why you'll see them do things like this, which I, I thought just absolutely bizarre uh, to see them doing seismic uh, exploration off the coast of Antarctica. There's absolutely no market forces that are driving that right now, especially because the um, the Antarctic Treaty would only, even if it was if it was let to expire, wouldn't expire till 2048. It can't be done until then. Um, likewise, with some of Russia's activities in the global far north, in the far, uh, you know, the Arctic, uh, around the transatlantic Arctic, um, and and also some of the, the you know the the work in energy um, speculation that China's doing, it's on a completely different scale um, and being driven by m much more strategic, either in the case of Russia, you know, spreading strategic corruption in some of these cases through projects like Nord Stream Two and Turk Stream. Or just for you know strategic uh, posturing um, for the future, um, it's not coupled to normal market forces. Not there. Um, I agree with uh, everything uh, Ben said and Mr. Sher uh, mentioned. Um, uh, what I think the main question here is, how will the market behave? Uh, yes, uh, gas market is becoming more globalized, um, but does abundance in the market means that prices will be lower than $3, which we're uh, experiencing now. Will there be um, grouping, as, as we see in, in the oil market right now, as, as OPEC plus cartel? Uh, actually, just a note, uh, Russia is, is very active in both of these cartels, both in uh, gas exporting countries forum and, and in OPEC, OPEC plus. Um, so that will be probably uh, the, the significant factor uh, in, in defining that. But overall, as I mentioned, with the, uh, the improvement of technology, with the elimination of the, all the constraints that we used to have with the pipeline gas, uh, the, the countries dependent on single source will have more than one source and uh, to import. I think that's, that's more important. That will actually decrease their vulnerability in, in face of geopolitical risks. And if I, sh I could add, even if those facilities aren't used 100%, they create an incentive. They they create the conditions by which um, everyone understands that there is always an alternative. And and I think more looking at that is something that's good, uh, an important part of the infrastructure. If if I could ask uh, one other question before we open up to the floor, um, 
In the past, the United States has played an important role. Um, somebody even said a driving role in some of these projects in helping you know, create things like the Southern Gas Corridor and so forth. Um, it's been involved, actually, I mean, uh, my colleagues, in, when I was in the Energy Bureau, were involved in discussions with Turkey and Israel and, and others in the East, regarding the Eastern Mediterranean. Looking at the, uh, today, looking at the at, you know, situation in Washington today, looking at the situation in Brussels today, looking at the situation in the, in the, in the capitals of the, in the Balkans as well as in the Caspian region, what kind of role, if any, do you think is advisable um, for the United States to sort of play or for other outside powers to play in terms of diplomacy or in engaging in helping foster projects? Um, I think um, up until now, United States um, strategy has been coherent enough in respect to um, uh, the EU's energy security. Actually, in my opinion, the United States has been more concerned about Europe's energy security than Europe itself, uh, for obvious reasons, uh, because Europe is not monolithic. <laughs> uh, uh, I think uh, continuing this, this strategy would be important. Uh, I do believe that at the end of the day, the commerciality of the projects dictate the, the success. Uh, I mean, in the free world, uh, and we have seen, we have heard that some some rate of returns are for, uh, for will be in the next 47 years. That doesn't concern them, but in the free world, uh, the commerciality of the projects dictate um, the success of it. And um, with the political support, it will be, of course, easier uh, to implement these projects. Uh, I've seen that working for uh, for the BTC pipeline and for the Southern Gas Corridor, uh, it's crucially important to have that support. But at the end of the day, uh, the $45 billion uh, decisions are made in the boardrooms, um, uh, so the commerciality is, is equally important. Yeah, I'd like to add, I mean, think about it. For all of the uh, apparent foreign policy, transatlantic uh, security discontinuities that we've seen and, and uh, to some extent evolving over the past several years. The one area uh, among maybe a few others, but certainly the one area that's been core to this uh, transatlantic security cooperation that's been extremely continuous um, has been the United States support of European energy security. Under the Obama administration, under the Trump administration, from Democrats to Republicans on Capitol Hill, legislation keeps coming out and uh, diplomatic work and, um, and, and you know, funding packages and uh, sanctions packages, et cetera, keep coming out to support the core tenets of European energy security in the face of um, you know, Russian malign energy activities. And I think, thank God that's the case, um, because uh, the national security of our partners and allies would be degraded significantly were it not. So I think the best thing that we can do going forward is to use these new tools, in particular this, uh, this new funding mechanism, to, to help bootstrap some of our diplomacy and help get some of these projects over the finish line that we've been engaging on diplomatically uh, from the United States and working with our partners in Brussels and within member states um, for many years. And, and we're close on a lot of them, and I think a billion dollars will go a long way to, to help that. Um, so the U.S. should keep an eye on how, how can we best allocate those resources and put together a um, kind of resource allocated uh, approach to make sure that those get done and, and help our security collectively sooner rather than later. Thanks. Uh, questions from the floor? Mark. Thank you very much. This was excellent. This is an excellent panel. I have one quick question, um, and the other one is uh, about storage facilities in the Balkans. Rauf, what is, and, and Ambassador Sher, what would be the available gas from the Southern Gas Corridor to the Balkans? Right now we have a contract, uh, Sokar has a contract with Bulgaria for one BCM and with Greece for one BCM. How much would be available in the future and when? And the second is, we're talking about the Balkan uh, gas hub uh, to be a trade platform. You can't have a trade platform without storage facilities. And the Balkans have been, particularly Macedonia, um, North Macedonia, Bosnia, and Bulgaria, most vulnerable to Russian gas interruptions 
precisely because they lacked uh, gas storage facilities. Bulgaria has half a BCM storage facility, will be expanded to one BCM, but is that enough for uh, a trade platform? And what is the future? Thank you. Uh, the quick version, obviously, one to Bulgaria, one to Greece. Um, that's what's contracted for the for the next 25 years. Um, we, we will see, certainly, um, we continue to explore uh, with SOCAR in the Caspian for other gas resources. Um, there is capacity in the pipeline, uh, depending on, you know, compression, et cetera. There are other sources that you can imagine uh, within the Caspian that might be able to be tapped into. So we're always interested in that if they are commercially viable. But right now, you know, we I can't tell you when that's coming online or how that's moving forward uh, because we just don't know. We just don't have that now. Um, the one thing I will say, it's funny that you mentioned the hubs. It's uh, It seems as if every country I hear about now wants to be a hub for natural gas. And I, and, 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 <laughs> And, and by definition, I'm, I, I don't think everyone can, um, or else no one is. So it will be interesting to see how that plays out. And obviously, storage is going, you know, whoever has the storage at some point, or the lines, or the LNG, you know, it, it will be interesting to see how this emerges. Um, but I, I, it's, it's an encouraging sign, but a, you know, a discouraging prospect that everyone thinks they can be the hub. Yeah, to follow on that, on the first point, of course, it will be uh, um, the amount of gas to be supplied from Caspian will depend on how fast Shatan is too, and then Karabakh and uh, Nakhchivan fields are being developed, and Afsharan field is being developed. Uh, uh, as far as the second uh, point concerns, I, I completely agree with you, and not only storage, uh, but also the liberalized market is is another caveat for for uh, for the um, for becoming a hub. Uh, just having a gas, and that's actually being said about Turkey and Greece as well. Just to put it in context, Turkey's gas storage is almost probably less than Azerbaijan's gas storage. For a country like that uh, to have five billion cubic meters gas storage is it's unbelievable. And uh, and then to have the uh, the ambition to claim that you're becoming a Gas hub is 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 delusional. Uh, it is becoming a gas transit country, but it's not becoming a gas hub, and that c applies to all these other countries as well, uh, as uh, as my colleague mentioned here. Um, so. That's, th these are two most important factors. In, Turkey has done a lot of work in liberalizing its market, but it still has a, way, a, a road to go. And they have uh, colossal plans to expand, and they do have potential actually to do so, with the salt caves and, uh, and I think coal caves as well, uh, but nothing tangible has been done so far. So that's, those are the ma major impediments. That's really interesting because they're one of the countries that is always talking about being a hub and is engaged, I think, with the United States very actively in the sort of I want to be a hub policy has been Turkey. Um, and that's sort of been the justification that Turkey has given for certain things, including you know, some of the, the, the flows of gas coming from, from the north. Um, can we talk a little bit more, though, about Eastern Med? I mean, do you see that as sort of entering into this, uh, this at all? I think it will. Uh, I mean, I think we'll have to see. Obviously, there. I mean, uh, shockingly, there are, there are geopolitical issues uh, around that one as well. Um, uh, yeah, which uh, I, I know it'll be upsetting that it's only Turkey and Greece, uh, but and and others who are helping. But um, I think um, you know, anytime you find that the resource, if it's commercially uh, uh, you know easy to get to, and there's a resource, then it can easily displace things that are less commercially viable. What's, of course, interesting is that in the region itself, you've got huge uh, potential users. And you have real, and Egypt's facility, LNG facilities are really not running at near capacity. So um, I think, you know, one, could, one would imagine from a strictly commercial perspective that the quickest and best way would be to tie back into Egypt field, you know, Egyptian fields and use the LNG facilities they have there. Obviously, we've all heard about pipelines and other ideas. Um, I, I'm, I'm no, uh, a, anyone who knows my background knows I'm not an engineer or a geologist or anything else that would allow me to say this with confidence other than I've listened to other people. That looks like it's hard. Um, I think the term I was told by our geologist was really, really hard uh, to get a pipeline from the Eastern Med into Europe, which is the other major um, sort of consumer. So, uh, 
and, and it does bring up the second question of, so who's, the, who's gonna pay for that, right? In, in a market that is increasingly um, global, where do you get the money for the infrastructure that creates such a very difficult and long uh, pipeline? But, hey, if it's there and if people can, can organize around it, and frankly, even seeing from an old geopolitics hand, uh, you know, seeing that uh, Israel gets invited to something in the Arab world even without the United States pushing for it is a pretty interesting and exciting development that really sh proves that there's a big resource there because otherwise I suspect that would not have happened. Great, thank you very much to all of you. Um, this has been really interesting and I apologize if this was covered in the first panel, which I wasn't able to make, but be interested if any of you, perhaps Ben or Ralph, could talk a little bit more specifically about Turkstream 2 and the prospects of it moving forward. I assume that it's gonna need to um, <clears throat> meet the same competition rules that Southstream did and would be interested in knowing how you see the fate of this moving forward, um, on what kind of a timeline, if, if any of it uh, at all. Uh, does it make it to Bulgaria, in fact, and beyond? Um, be interested in, in hearing what the real viability of it is uh, from your perspective, very specifically for the Western Balkans uh, countries. I think the short answer will be that even Gazprom doesn't know uh, whether or when Turkestan will happen. I think they are just playing by ear right now. Uh, and also you have to understand that uh, Turkestan is also an element of larger Russian-Turkish relations, which is yeah. under stress right now because of Syria. And it's not only Turkstream 2, there's Akku, uh, there's other projects as well. Uh, so we don't, we, I don't know, <laughs> it's, uh, it's a Pandora box in this stage. Um, however, there have been signals uh, by Bulgaria mainly, uh, you know, they, they're eager, or they're, they have received or a certain amount they're eager to receive. But then, then we've seen mixed signals for Bulgaria saying that, you know, half of the, uh, the gas import will come from the US LNG. Um, of course, there are some countries that, are, because of the, the the list of the companies that I mentioned, that Gazprom subsidiaries in these countries, they are more becoming more uh, have become more dependent on Russian um, support or Russian infrastructure. Uh, they will have less freedom to in their in their in their foreign policy in their decisions. But um, I think the third energy package and its uh, clauses will be. Uh, the instrumental in deciding whether uh, Turkstream 2 has basically a South Stream, uh, light version South Stream will have future or not. So I would, I would say that from Gazprom's perspective, the second line of Turkstream as it came online just to the, over the Bulgarian border and at the, just you know, two months ago at the start of this year, already is having that impact that uh, the Kremlin wants, uh, which is to limit gas transit via Ukraine. It's already, as I said uh, uh, in my opener, um, it, it's brought the gas transit through the, the Trans-Balkan line that was fairly robust up until uh, the end of December down to 15% of, uh, of its capacity for gas that exits Ukraine and enters Romania. And all of the gas that was ultimately going to Bulgaria, Turkey, Greece, uh, from from Russia via Ukraine now is going through uh, the the Turk Stream conduit. Um, the question, of course, is then as as you're, you're asking, Mary, the onshore portion is going to have real real big questions on its um, ability to comply with the same sort of rules that Nord Stream Two potentially will have to and hopefully will have to comply with should it ever be completed, which is the updated gas directive. Um, and again, Bulgar Transgas is going to be right in the same boat as the Bundesnetzagentur in Germany um, in, in how it tries to either A, uh, approve the pipeline and somehow argue that, that this does not have a negative impact on other EU member states' security, energy security, or on the, on the union as a whole, um, or else say that it's not certified. And then I don't know, I mean, obviously what happens in that case if Bulgar Transgas is, is uh, helping to advance the onshore portion um, and, and then onwards into you know, Serbia and, and onward. Um, so it, it's really going to be um, incumbent on the European Commission, in particular DG Energy, to continue to basically keep the screws on these, um, these two transmission system operators to, to play by the rules, because the OPAL decision that we saw last fall where 
um, Poland and, um, and co-signatories, Lithuania and other, uh, a couple of the Baltic states that were co-signatories of this, this set a legal case, uh, uh, case law standard that you can't just limit your scope of, of your review of the national security impact, energy security impact of, of a pipeline, in that case, OPAL, to just the country that it's in. It's, it's gotta, gotta look at other neighboring nations, in that case, Poland. Um, so what are the impacts on Romania? What are the impacts on Greece? That, those are, are the questions that are going to continue to have to be asked in, in the Turk stream case. And I don't know if they can be answered in the positive. So it's really gonna be a question um, if somehow the approvals come in from Berlin uh, and Sofia, um, that, well, what does the commission do at that point? Because there's already case law that, that Warsaw has succeeded in, um, in challenging uh, and, and beyond. So um, do they open up an ECJ case uh, you know, because of that? Um, there's a lot of questions. That's why I think it's gonna be a long time before these come online as full pipelines, if they ever come online as Gazprom originally intended, which I hope they don't. Hi, thanks for being here today. Uh, Nick Cropper from the American Security Project. Um, to what extent do you see Europe's continued development of renewables uh, diminishing the geostrategic value of Russia's gas pipelines in the Balkans? And how do you see Russia responding to that in the long term? I'll just say from a market perspective, uh, we we. Uh, you know, we fully expect that in the medium term that will, uh, the, the, main, the main energy source that we would hope is changing, especially if we have a limited carbon budget for this world is, carb is uh, coal. So, um, but renewables at a, a strong pace are something that I think everyone is supportive of in the EU. Obviously, we've talked about that in the first session. That's an important piece, <clears throat> but I think it's going to be a while if you look at the penetration of renewables before they are going to be able to take on a hugely, a huge significant percentage of the energy uh, production other in from natural gas. Um, obviously, off into the future, I don't think our, our modeling suggests there's no doubt that natural gas will go down as well. Um, but there will always be a, there, there's a likelihood that out into 2040, 2050 even, that there will be a significant amount of natural gas, um, perhaps decarbonized, but uh, natural gas is part of the mix in Europe and, and elsewhere. Um, what I think will be interesting to see is, does that put a premium on the lowest cost provider of natural gas? And you know, we've, we've had that discussion, but in many cases that, that the lower cost will be piped gas. Um, doesn't matter where, it's, but I mean, it's always going to be somewhat cheaper than uh, LNG. So that will be an interesting sort of evolution to see where the market goes. But there's no doubt renewables are going to have an increasing effect. They're just so relatively small now that they, they can increase at an incredibly large clip as they have. And we still have a number of decades while where natural gas is still an important fuel. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, to combat climate change, we need to get to a point where our technology, in, in terms of renewable technologies and even horizontal technologies, as I sometimes talk about, as a physicist, I hope that eventually we have you know, thermonuclear fusion uh, at grid scale that we can do and, and couple that with grid scale storage and existing renewables to get to a point where um, you know, we, we eliminate carbon emissions. Uh, but it's, it's gonna be a while, um, and the, the nice part about renewables is that it decouples the geopolitics of the resource, right? The sun, geothermal, um, uh, uh, you know, ocean, uh, um, tidal, you know, tidal currents, etc., uh, waterfalls. Um, it takes those away and decouples the resource from the geopolitics. However, then the technology comes into play. So then you're gonna be talking more about geopolitics of intellectual property associated with advanced renewable technologies or fusion technologies uh, in the decades to come. And I hope we're having that discussion because that means that we've started to eliminate some of the geopolitical competition and um, you know, 
strategic corruption and influence that uh, that's uh, that our resources right now are using. But it's going to be a while, so that there is this this bridge period before we can really see what the geopolitical impact is. Yeah, specifically for Balkans, I think the the problem is also the. Uh, the different status of membership uh, at EU, uh, that brings also the commitment to the EU regulations. Uh, I think the main competition in Balkans should be, be between renewables and coal because coal is the, is the dominant uh, source right now and it's, it's more detrimental than, than the gas. Um, as, as far as um, Gazprom concerns, Gazprom's uh, recent uh, activities show that they are they're, they're trying to adapt to the commercial reality. Uh, they are trying to sell more gas uh, uh, on spot base uh, to to delink because they are they see that the reality is that the the market trends are changing. So I would assume the same approach from them, just to try to adapt to the market reality, uh, which actually uh, defeats the whole purpose of uh, bringing those countries uh, into dependence into Russia. Because in that case, those countries that it was mentioned before become more independent. One thing, too, I might add on this, this point is that if you look at you know, what countries are talking about going to renewables, it's what, you know, maximum goals are things like 20%. That includes hydro. Now, granted, the amount of renewables is increasing and, and should, but, and it's, I mean, look at China's the, you know, massive increase. In the United States, there's a massive increase in the use of renewables. But, okay, it's 20%, that leaves 80%. One other factor in Europe, which we haven't really talked about, is the neuralgia regarding nuclear. Um, and so as first Austria, now Germany, others pull out of nuclear, something's got to take its place. And so all these different pieces of these equations are all going to be working at the same time. So yes, there's a, you know, I see, you know, rising demand for, for renewables, but at the same time, some sort of hydrocarbon is going to still be needed in the near future. And as, as, as Bob said, you want to use the, the cleanest that you can, and right now, the cleanest of, of things that you can burn for, for, for electricity is, is gas until we can actually you know, move either phys you know, in terms of the physics and in terms of technology, but also in terms of the policy into acceptance of, of nuclear. Mikhail Korchenkin, Eastern European Gas Analysis. Actually, I disagree about the uh, inexpensive transportation by pipeline. It only works if uh, the pipeline matches the uh, market demand. Uh, it's the same as if you use 18-wheeler to uh, transport stuff that can be brought by a pickup truck. This is the case of Turkstream, for instance. Two pipelines, 31.5 BCM of capacity, shipping less than 10 billion cubic meters a year. Uh, it's definitely more expensive than uh, any LNG delivered by a tanker of a normal size. If they start delivering by 5,000 ton tankers, uh, they may lose. But if uh, they use uh, about 100,000 tons, uh, they definitely win. I'm just, I, certainly, the, the, given that the market of, for gas is not a perfect market by any means. But if you just go by Henry Hub, you know, and you assume that Henry Hub is a is a global market price, obviously long-term contracts are a lot of other pieces, but um, LNG is Henry Hub plus, right? It's it, 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 it's just what it is. And it's, it's, and you know, why is Qatar a terrific place to have natural gas? Because it's plus for LNG is the same to go to Europe as it is to Asia. And Every contract has its own uh, price formula. Right, but I'm so, just, I, I, it, it, you are right in specific. I, I, I think in general, as this market becomes a little more, uh, you know, global, um, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick to it costs more because you're going to have to ship it. But uh, it's, a, it's a fair point. It is more complicated than that. Right. And there's another interesting observation. Uh, for instance, in the first uh, 50 plus days of uh, 2020, the power generation... Uh, wind power generation of Germany exceeded the combined uh, power generated by coal, gas, and uh, whatever. Anyway, coal, coal and gas, definitely. And nuclear, correct, right. So the wind power definitely taking over in Germany. It's the number one uh, component in the energy basket. 
Unfortunately, Ger I'm sorry. Unfortunately, Germany is not the benchmark for whole Europe. Germany has has been in leading positions in renewables. And even Germany Actually, is having trouble now p placing new windmills and so forth, and it gets more complex. But right. I mean, and Germany's history is also a little different, given the decarbonization and the old Ostona. I will say I have, a, I have a really cool app that tells me in, in like in New England and in California, and there may be others, sort of what percentage is by renewables, what percentage is by, you know, so you, you can see what, what it is. There's no doubt it is growing at a tremendous rate and, and faster than, than the penetration of any other energy source that we have seen in history. But it's 4% now. So um, it can continue to grow and should continue to grow faster than any other, than the, than the adaptation of any other new source of energy. But we still have some time before that means that outside of Germany, perhaps, that it's going to be, uh, you know, that we're gonna need, that we're gonna be able to not burn any hydrocarbons. And I would add just quickly on your, your first point on TurkStream, um, it seems like a very large sunk cost for the, both the technical rigor of the type of pipeline being really deep sea, um, and and the you know compared to the the percentage of the, the uh, volume of gas that's being uh, conveyed um, and only to remove gas that's already going through existing pipelines in Ukraine, so I again do not see that as a commercial project in any way, shape, or form. It's a strategic project on the, on behalf of the Kremlin, um, but of course we can all come back in 2067 and find out if we were wrong because. Uh, that that's the day that the uh, that that Gazprom can you know get its first uh, profit paycheck uh, <laughs> sent to Moscow. So um, if anyone here uh, is around, just hang on to see that we'll be able to prove that's uh, right or wrong. <laughs> I, I can tell you, I won't be here at that point. So I, I think on that note, it probably is our our, our last our, our our last question. Thank you all very much. And do you want to say something or? Thank you, everyone, for coming today. And uh, I'd like to thank Margarita Senova for putting this wonderful event together and give her a big round of applause, and thank you. We'll have the event posted online in a couple of days, so uh, be sure to visit Jamestown again, and look forward to seeing you again in another future event. Thank you.